Academy in Rome and fellow of the Society of Architectural Historians. Diane Fabro served as president of the Society of Architectural Historians, director of the Experiential Technology Center and associate dean academic affairs for the UCLA School of Arts and Architecture. Diane's intriguing lecture tonight will project ancient Roman architecture into the contemporary world. She will address the connections between contemporary design and ancient Roman architecture. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Favreau to the podium. Thank you, Alessandro. It's a pleasure to be here for, for many, many reasons, most of which is to see friends, make old friends and make new friends. And so thank you uh, for coming tonight. Let's see. Over the last few decades, scholarship on Roman cities has profitably responded to a wide range of turns, inspired by the agendas, tools, and methodologies of other disciplines. As researchers pivoted towards the spatial issues of the 1960s and 70s, they logically looked to architecture and urban design, exploring such topics as mind mapping, phenomenology, and networking. Half a century later, the study of ancient urban spaces is increasingly urgent as historic environments are challenged and deformed by intense urban construction, political exploitation, digital interrogations, tourism, and vandalism. Expanding and challenging extant boundaries and methods, diverse disciplines are flexing and colliding experiencing such transdisciplinary redirections as the spatial turn, the digital turn, the sensory turn, and so on. Description of today's interactions between modern and Roman architectural studies as a turn seems inadequate to me, as it implies a rotation from one thing to another in a singular direction. A more apt metaphor is the highly spatialized form of a moebius band, a topological construct with a non-orientable surface having only one side and one boundary curve, no start or end. The Moebius strip was discovered in the 19th century by A.F. Moebius, long before Facebook adopted it for Meta. It appeared much earlier in third century Roman mosaic depicting Ion, the god of unbounded time. A continuous form twisting over and seemingly through itself, this band captures the unbroken, bending, realigning, layering, opposing, and penetrating interactions of approaches to space in modern design. These fluid manu maneuverings can trigger the reframing of inquiries about Roman space, which is going to be my subject today. The following selective examples focus on public open spaces and issues particularly relevant to design in the 21st century. And consider three particular twists that to me offer um, particularly rich possibilities for the study of Roman urban environments, inactivating, permeating, and flowing. To begin, two essential challenges confound explorations of ancient architecture and must be articulated if we can't resolve them. First is the obvious difficulty of dealing with space, an intangible design defined by its ontological vagueness. Familiar, pervasive, and transparent, space is hard to grasp, conceptually as well as literally. How does one make it an object of study? Often space is explained architecturally as what is purposely contained by built works, or rather, whatever isn't built, or whatever's left over. Lacking its own edges, where does it begin and end? How can it be measured? Can it even be theorized? Why are ancient written descriptions of voids few and lacking in specificity? Was the urban space too familiar? and yet too dispersed to be recognized and fully integrated or interrogated in the Roman world? This last question brings us to the second challenge of dealing with a 
non-living culture with fragmentary environmental remains and silent voices. Unable to talk with human occupants of Roman spaces, how can researchers examine their uses, their meanings, their valuation? Much past research has been done from a universalist, scientific-oriented, culturally new neutral, as if we could ever be culturally new, neutral, etic approach based on the conceptual and perceptual frameworks of the researchers' cultural horizons. Increasingly, Romanists are exploring more localized emic tactics that attempt to parse or recreate or conceptualize for them, uh, the meanings in the particular historical period. By interrogating both emic and etic tactics, scholars acknowledge they are not oppositional, but comp complementary positionings, irrevocably intertwined. Both are useful and both are flawed. Well, let's now turn to modern influences between er, um, the past and today, but I'll start with the modern. The advent of realistic, comprehensive digital urban simulation models in the 1980s was touted as a boon to contemporary architecture and urban design. Interestingly, uh, early adopters sought to legitimize the technolo technologies, many which had been developed by the military, by association with the classical past, a strategy still favored today. First generation digital humanists, myself included, deployed simulation modeling to render classical architecture and cities, something only possible, by the way, in architecture departments, which had both the technology and the interest to do so. Dealing with incomplete information, the best examples carefully fashioned whole structures by drawing upon fragmentary evidence, comparanda, and ancient pictorial representations, all documented in metadata. The completed simulations limited representations of voids or human activities, unrealistic viewing situations, and over and throughout there was always an overemphasis on high level viewing, that is looking down, and of course flying, because if you could fly, why wouldn't you? However, the process of creating the models provided notable advances in spatial knowledge. Most significant were the measuring and geo-referencing of environments, uniform placement of monu sorry, uniform placement of monuments helped to define and delimit public roads and facilitated comparisons of examples. And it drew attention to ground levels, to pavings, construction phasing, and subterranean features, which all became critical subjects. Vertically, the quest for reconstruction information for the upper portions of buildings sparked further study of view sheds and, sad and shadows across urban spaces, as well as an interest in skylines. What was the skylight of Rome really like, ancient Rome really like? In the 21st century, more than half of the world is now living in cities. Contemporary pressure on open urban spaces are challenging various fields including ancient studies, to reconceptualize why and how we study urban voids. Contemporary spaces are no longer examined as, uh, spaces are no longer examined as unbuilt elements or as passive stages, but instead as living, evolving participants of city form and activities. This animation is leading to a greater dialogue between archeologists and contemporary architects and planners as all seek to harness new technologies, new approaches, new theories, and new attitudes to understand the effective qualities of space over and through time. Evolving from cognitive sciences, inactivism is the noun, is the notion that cognition arises through a dynamic interaction between living entities and their environments. The exchange is not merely informational. Both organisms and their surroundings actively and asymmetrically regulate the conditions of their exchange and in so doing enact a world. Simply, architecture and space 
provoke each other. In 1966, the perceptual psychologist James Gibson employed the term, the term affordance to describe something that compels certain actions people can or should take. Affordances are associated with action possibilities, readily perceivable by human actors and informed by culturally constituted signifiers communicating with actions that should take place and where they should take place. Simply an environment or interface affords opportunities for an action. In recent years, explorations of robotic artificial intelligent learning as well as experiments in crowd simulation have led to an escalating entrance, interest in the affordances of architectural and urban design. Among others, spearheading, let's see, come on. Uh, spearheading the movement is the Dutch firm Rietveld Art, Architecture Art Afford, Affordances, RAAF, whose installation, The End of Sitting, demonstrates how bu built forms and shapes, designed voids and users all reciprocally afford activities. With low sloping walls encouraging leaning and communication with a neighbor and a shadowy angled corner encouraging singular nesting into the space. Together the forms, voids, and humans create interactive evolving ecologies enacted through and with sensory engagement. The current sensory turn is stimulating in activist studies. The AHRC Century Cities Network at Brunel University in London utilizes sensory research to understand relationships between multicultural personal experiences and feelings in urban environments. They have developed a think kit, which you can get online, to frame, quote, the exploration of the urban sensorium and the design and implementation of research, unquote. Initial examinations of ancient sensory fields had focused almost primarily on the visual for obvious reasons. Um, more recently, they are exploring the situated nature of perceptual experience. Kinetic analyses consider now a, strong, a broad range of motor sensations, not only in well-defined closed environments such as houses, but in larger urban spaces, especially streets. Sensory archaeology is now developing protocols for gathering, assessing, and comparing data on bodily reactions, in addition to informing studies on Roman walking, spectatorship, processions, and other outdoor activities in ancient open spaces. Close readings of architectural remains situate human actions in and round spaces. Worn stairs reveal extreme use, locations of carved game boards, affirm gathering spots, and so on. Equally valuable are sensory experiments underway with recreated digital environments, such as acoustical studies of sound distribution in the Roman Forum. And here, these uh, red places are showing you the rost different locations of the rostra. And if somebody were standing on there, how, long, uh, how big of an audience would the human voice reach? This work has been done by Susan Muth. <laughs> Equally valuable are sensory, uh, let's see, I think I said that. Um, effective and activist analyses require specific information. Smart cities provide modern architects with much finer grained information about those who may occupy their designs and how than we can gather from ancient sources. Detailed sense walks, activity tracking, bio monitoring, ambient sensing, activity uh, tracking, and thermal mapping provide expansive and diverse sociomotor data to facilitate comparative assessment. And as you can see, um, this is assessing cell phone activity in Rome during Madonna's concert. Obviously, it's impossible to compile this kind of quantified data on human action in ancient cities. Information on modern environments cannot be in easily transferred in to ancient contexts. However, some contemporary tools and methods can be used to enrich explorations of past spaces. For example, crowd simulations 
uh, software can provide insights about movement in large uh, ancient entertainment structures or spaces like the Forum or the Colosseum. Neuroscientific studies also open related avenues for Roman spatial studies. Research on action, perception, and empathy in relation to the aesthetic experience have the potential to inform and activate analyses of aesthetic emotional responses in specific environments. Um, and these are two emotion maps of San Francisco, and that big spike there is when somebody tries to walk across that freeway. But this of course, you can't translate directly to have some Roman wear one of these monitors, but you can start to think about uh, emotional responses, fearscapes, for example, um, and other gut responses. And there are variations among individuals based on race, gender, and background. After all, sensory perception is culturally constituted and socially adopted, so we do have to think about um, the backgrounds of who is looking and what they're doing. Perception is some, not something that happens to humans, it's what they do. How can one successfully explore historic human spatial interaction about past dwellers without interviews and other documentation? Projected etic um, responses are useful for example, we could say that um, here at Palm, at uh, Jarasa, the curving pattern of pavers in the Oval Plaza complete, compelled ancient pedestrians to follow along the curving sides rather than move straight across the central space. And on hot days that the porticos entice them to lo loiter in the shade and walk along the sides. After pushing through the crowds in the Roman Forum, pedestrians might have changed their pace when they entered the Forum Transitorium with its gardens and flowing water and assumed a, more of a saunter that you would have in a, in a Roman villa garden. Such imaginary reactions seem possible, but all remain hard to document and evaluate and are unavoidably informed by modern assumptions. Scientific protocols help legitimize spatial inquiries. Hard data about sensory stimuli acknowledging different climatic conditions provide researchers with comparable source materials. Shared open source documentation of sensory and archaeological data about ancient space is essential, including on-site measurements at different times and under different weather conditions as well as collations of textual and pictorial evidence. Archaeological sites can be reconstructed as laboratory or reconceptualized, sorry, as laboratories for non-invasive experiments uh, reactivating the spaces. For example, after conducting conducting emic analyses of a city's history, occupants and events, Informed researchers could enact movement along a modern Roman urban street and document the temperatures and uh, the amount of the widths and um, heights of various spaces, probable rates of speed, and other affordances. This soft data then could be collated with hard documentation of pavement heat and shadows uh, and so forth to determine where and when ancient people might have gathered. And there's a whole range of scientific uh, approaches to figuring out paths. And one that I find very intriguing is biomimicry, where you take um, uh, slime mold modeling to project logical transport connections. And the diagram you're seeing on, on your right shows that the um, mold, slime mold moves along a topo recreated topography and pretty much follows exactly the same topography by uh, Roman roads. Digital simulation of fully Roman environments allow for expanded, inactivated analyses, though always with the caveat that many reconstructed features, especially the op 
upper parts of buildings which are not preserved. These are always hypothetical. Utilizing gaming engines, such as Unity, researchers simulate and quantify human movement um, in such spaces and raise valuable, all of these raise all valuable questions that we should ask. So it's not necessarily the product that you're seeing, but the questions that come out of it. For example, here in a Roman Republican funeral, would uneven pavements and glare from marble stones hinder kinetic viewing? What was the projected speed of moving through the forum? Was construction noise halted when there were speeches in this space? Uh, and similar questions. The answers will always carry the taint of subjectivity, yet stimulated, exper simulated experiments validate the study of urban space as intertwining void and solid, embodied and embodying experiences in a continuous self-referencing loop. The famous map of Rome by Giambattista Noli inspired and is inspiring generations of architects and planners who admire its clear distinctions, black hatching representing private zones, white areas, public. Come on. The figure ground representation characterized voids as hard edged and planar cementing the notion that spaces had roughly the same vertical dimensions as surrounding buildings. Modern awareness of the fluidity and permeability of space is epitomized by the design explorations of contemporary architects that interrogate inside and outside space and void. Come on. In 1998, Ben Van Berkel and Caroline Boss of UN Studio completed the Moebus House in ne the Netherlands. The structure's intertwining trajectory of forms creates a spatial loop that at times inverts uh, with, the with the landscape visually and literally projecting indoors, the concrete shell forming, transforming into interior furniture and activities flowing and folding during the family's 24-hour living working cycle. A complexity that requires both firsthand experience of the building and, truth be told, a verbal explanation. Permeability was taken even further in 2002 with the design of the Blue Blur building for the Swiss Expo in, uh, by Diller, Scofidio, and Renfo. Labeled an architecture of atmosphere, the temporary installation was loosely defined by a fine mist emitted by 35,000 high pressure nozzles. On entering the low, def defin low definition cloud, pedestrians found all traditional visual and acoustic references erased. They instead moved through an indistinct environment inactivated by a damp, pulsating, and by the way, edible fog, permeating every dimension. Oops, let me go back. Come on. When the uh, exhibition ended, the Blur Building was dismantled. In Elements of Architecture, Assembling Archaeology, Atmosphere, and the Performance of Building Spaces, editors Mike Bile and Tim Flor Sorensen ask, what would later archaeologists have made of the remains if the Blur building decayed naturally, with no hard material evidence to define its edges or its immersive experience? This query, which could also be extended to the Moebus house or to long gone Roman environments, clarifies the challenges of studying space and permeability in relation uh, to historic environments. The attempted literalization and interrogation of loosely bound occupiable space emphasized in these two modern design projects are rare. In most cases, humans are able to visualize the negative space, the void of a room or an urban space only when it has clearly defined enclosing edges, but they struggle to define less well-prescribed voids. 
For the Romans, vision and words were defining. They identified the celestial vault as the portion of the sky that could be seen. When taking auguries to tell the future, a Roman priest sat in a specific spot looking upward and he waved a staff to loosely prescribe four aerial quadrants. How they were divided, I don't know, but he just waved his wand around. And uh, maybe having a, a point reference such as a tree or a rock. Um, by interpreting every action of, that happened in that so loosely prescribed quadrant, birds flying, lightning, and so on, uh, he would tell the future. Simply unconstrained space had to be determined by sight and by words, not by formal hard edges. And it was reinforced by gesture. Describing space by defining the visual field of an immobile spectator persisted over the centuries. In the 16th century, the term landscape was deployed to describe what could be seen and was soon adopted by artists who fixed sky, ground, built elements and time elements all within a frame. By the 20th century, scape studies expanded beyond the construction of the pictorial and became inactivated. In 1993, anthropologist Ingold wrote, quote, no feature of the landscape is of itself a boundary. It can only become a boundary or the indicator of a boundary in relation to the activities of people, unquote. For Ingold, the landscape was not defined as a constrained visual space, but by overlapping task scapes, a def definition that emphasized the variability and functional complexity of animated human spatial occupation. In recent years, scape has become a common suffix in architecture used to define everything from idea realms, ideoscapes, to visual fields for GIS, viewscapes, to sensory and emotional environments, smellscapes, soundscapes, fearscapes, you get the picture. Despite nuanced differences in specifics, the plethora of modern scapes was not described by external static viewers, um, like we saw the Romans doing, but by immersed kinetic occupants. All are highly permeable, all simultaneously overlap, their undulating edges and varied intensities constantly intersecting. Following this conceptualization, a Roman street can be interrogated not only as a path experienced by mobile us users, but also as an animated scape. As pedestrians moved along a crowded street, the negative space itself pulsated and flowed like a fog, passing laterally into flanking doorways and alleyways and porticos, downward into drain holes and upward to meld into the sky. The continuous void was filled with varying sub areas. A dark alley presented a fearscape intensified by the smellscape generated by garbage piles. Teachers residing in porticos were challenged by the activity of noisy vehicles moving by, which created large uh, soundscapes. Similar consideration of scapes within internalized unroofed public environments opened up assessments, no pun intended, uh, or no, well, I did intend it, sorry. Uh, <laughs> past subjects of Roman public open air enclosure, enclosures had centered on fora, logically, with spatial conclusions based on close rereadings, readings of two dimensional plans and axial views. This is what you normally see um, a map with a view looking directly on a temple. And of course, your view is floating somewhere way above human uh, eye level. These thinking about space has led to reassessments. Um, many complexes were not entered on axis. This is still the same uh, site in North Africa. And you see that these view sheds with the red 
um, lines there, none of them look at the major building in the space. Um, let's see, I lost my spot. And, okay. And you, what we see is that uh, the space doesn't seem as contained experientially as it does when you look at it in the plan when you look at, across diagonally at the space where the porticos around um, kind of create a soft edge with the sha deep shadows going into them more dramatically the wide size of the unbuilt areas emphasized the sky up above which overwhelmed the human-made structures at ground level, Roman spaces were defined by human occupation as much as by per the perception of specific shapes or limits. For example, roadways often crossed through fora and operated as traffic scapes uh, with different pavers. On the left is uh, Ostia, and we usually see a reconstruction like that at the left, but you don't realize there's a road going right through, uh, through it in the... Let's see if I can get this to work. The road's going right through the middle of it. So this is not such a contained space if you have this um, movement constantly going through it. These spaces were also filled with activities, um, temporary theater structures blocked entire fora, statues, bases, benches, as well as ephemeral awnings uh, potted plants, workbenches, and people continuously shaped and reshaped spatial identity and use by reorienting places and creating sensory and activity scapes that attracted or repelled. Uh, for example, one of my favorite stories is Suetonius tells us that the smellscape generated by the ritual meal the priests were preparing up in the temple of Mars in Rome enticed him to say uh, he was holding a court case down below, he said, I'm going up there and getting something to eat, shifting groupings and concentrations in the Forum of Augustus. More lofty spatial reactions to Roman space are difficult to assess, but may be informed by modern reactions. Looking at the interior of a great Roman bath, architect Louis Kahn commented, quote, we all know that we can bathe just as well under an eight foot ceiling as we can under a 150 foot ceiling. But I believe there's something about a 150 foot ceiling that makes a man a different kind of man. Unquote. The amorous extent of scapes makes them difficult to compare and identify. Overlapping. Um, con uh, constantly, they uh, have as many complexities as the Blur building. Such drawbacks, however, parallel ancient conceptions. In the Roman world, the lack of literacy, complex documentation, and readily accessed information compelled people to ry rely on impressions rather than precise uh, limits. The evolving field of Escape studies is developing protocols for fuzzy thinking and fuzzy data. Architect Antonio Saggio writes, quote, the new scapes indicate a new way on the horizon of seeing, designing, and inhabiting space through the interpretation of the work as a complex system of connections, interchange, and retroactions, constantly open, constantly flexible, constantly mo modifiable, unquote. Such thinking can enliven questions about Roman spatial boundaries that seem irritatingly imprecise. For example, the ritual line of the Pomerium, the ritual line of the city of Rome, was prescribed supposedly at the initial moment by plowing a line around the city. But in reality, it wasn't a hard uh, edge, a hard continuous edge. At Rome, pomerial extensions were marked with these small markers like the one on the left that said, this is a marker, it, the line is here somewhere. Um, after all, people in the capital city not only needed 
All they needed to know whether they were inside or outside a ritual line on a ritual day, and then somebody would make it very obvious to them. Um, and on the right, you see how distributed those markers are in the city of Rome with the red circles. Similarly, the animation of edge conditions is explicit in some Roman laws. Um, so for example, some laws extended to the edge of the tile roofs. Well, that's the edge of the growing city, but who's going to go out and mark the tile roof? Because then the next building's built and the tile roof is there. So it's very amorphous, it's fluctuating. Like the visitors to the Blur building, Romans in the ancient capital could not see or touch the urban edge, but realized when they entered or exited diverse interpenetrating scapes. Contemporary architects and planners find the dynamic nonlinear characteristics of flows apt for modern, our modern era of indeterminacy and erratic forces. Rather than creating environments inspired by aesthetics, fixed geometries, and clarity of functions, de designers are considering, quote, sequence of motions and moments made by different movements in which everything flows, unquote. Examples abound in the work of Rem Koolhaas. Um, we've moved on to flowing, as you can tell. Um, and his firm OMA, uh, the torsion of voids and solids continuously confronts and confounds a structure from top to bottom, as in this example from Beijing. Such projects necessitate the thoughtful consideration of spatial flows that are always on the way to another instantiation. Thinking about flows can help recalibrate the assessment of ancient spaces by shifting the examination from their containment within a specific moment in time or a fixed built fabric to their fluctuating extent in greater temporal and physical environments. Plutarch in the first century wrote, to create a multiplicity or rather an infinity of cities by chronological distinctions is like creating many men out of one. Scholars and architects have long grappled with the difficulties of studying temporal flow of cities. A comprehensive time-lapse sequence of urban evolution can rarely be recreated. Period periodization is necessary and useful, as evident with the chronological layering of urban change in digital uh, thick maps such as this one. However, such slicing into temporal snapshots tends to deter examination of evolving, of the gerund, of ongoing. For example, labeling a building or space Augustine can be misleading. Uh, after all, he had a very long lifespan, and during that time, a single building could have been torn down, burned, collapsed, rebuilt, added onto, and so forth. The situation is further complicated by a reasonable but problematic modern preoccupation with identifying the finished form of buildings. Left with fragments, archaeologists naturally attempt to complete the puzzle. But this leads to privileging of one moment in a building's life, its idealized completion, rather than the rough realities. Shown here is a reconstruction of the Great Temple of Sardis, which is about the size of a football field, with 54 projected outer columns uh, to make it complete, but the Romans only erected, erected 15. In recent years, the repeated use of the term afterlife continues to emphasize the perceived moment of completion rather than an evolving building life. As a result, there's very little outcry when, ancient environment is when an ancient environment is reconstructed with buildings from different periods, all shown in perfected form as if all just came off the assembly line, freed from aging or transformation. By shifting attention to spaces, 
rather than built solids, the preoccupation with idealized completing build, completed buildings lessens, allowing for exploration of the diverse, intertwined temporal flows of ongoing experiences and instantiations. Buildings are extensive, expensive, and long-lasting. They cast deep shadows over communities. Oops, let's see, did I miss one one? There. In 1994, the influential futurist Stuart Brand published How Buildings Learn, What Happens After They're Built, in which he explored the transformation that occur as structures age, change fu functions, and suffer damage. Recent decades have seen Romanists increasingly explore the post-completion life of structures, Moving beyond the ever popular subject of spolia, they are interrogating restoration, demolition laws, recycling, defacement, and ancient heritage uh, preservation. To date, few have explored the impact of such work in relation to urban space or how space itself can be reused, altered, preserved by human activities. Consideration of flowing changes activates and recalibrates spatial assessment. For example, city forms are generally depicted as relatively unencumbered spaces with unmoving structures and sculptures, yet an unending flow of objects, people, events, shadows, floods, and changing sensory uh, stimuli repeated, repeatedly redefine the space. That diagram that was on a little too slow was showing um, smellscapes and uh, noisecapes during construction of the Temple of uh, Julius Caesar. Um, and this is showing you how adding an awning in the summer can change the um, appearance of a uh, and spatial configuration of a Roman space. Temporal flow impacted most public areas as the annual or daily repetition of rituals and other events form spatial choreographies with high points of intense activity contrasted with periods of relative dormancy as the seasons flowed by. And you'll notice in all these reconstructions, they're very clean and there's very few people and they're usually all upper class. The evolutionary flows and twists of the lives of urban spaces are also revealed by a close examination of their creation. Inspired by the architectural and artistic notion of thinking through practice, scholars are now studying the process of making ancient buildings. Research on building techniques and sequences of spaces, as well as the circulation of labor and materials is facilitated by the emergence of a new field called construction archaeology, which has, uh, which is distinct from regular archaeology with and has a whole set of new protocols. Further insights are derived from critical reassessment of ancient written and artistic descriptions of construction in progress. Building projects continuously transformed urban spaces at er, every level, and you can see a crane in this uh, reconstruction at the top and piles of stones that would have filled the Roman Forum during the construction of the Arch of, of Septimius Severus. During construction, an urban space would change at every level with opening of large pits um, covering the ground level with materials, obscuring the sky with scaffolds and machinery, uh, and on and on it goes. When the first emperor, Augustus, promoted the shift to marble as the primary building material in the Roman cap capital, the dust from all of his uh, new marble works settled on every sur surface, justifying his boast that he had transformed Rome into a city of marble. The use, evolution, and demise of Roman spaces are not easily documented. Furthermore, the means to represent the flow of special, spatial changes are limited. 
I'm just going to give you sort of an idea here by looking at this uh, one side of Duga in Tunisia, which in plans and even in the reconstruction, you don't get a sense of the level changes, which go from around 0.6 to up to five meters in height. That's a lot of dif dis difference in the changes. Architects um, have always tested concepts through visual representations. The digital revolution has helped to legitimize modeling as research, not just illustrations, and to validate the application of many valued fuzzy logic in ancient studies. Roman researchers are now expand, expanding experimental archaeology, which previously had centered on how do you make a tool and then re, trying to recreate it. Um, embracing not only hypothetical in, uh, reconstructions, but also scientific tests within 3D models, virtual reality simulations, and gaming worlds. Such malleable creations promote investigations of flows within recreated spaces and across time. For example, pan-urban studies are enriched by procedural modeling, an umbrella term referring to various techniques um, in computer graphics harnessed by contemporary urban planners to generate 3D models of entire cityscapes based on a set of rules. And th this is a recreation of Pompeii. Um, and with this complex methodology, researchers do not model individual structures. I'm having trouble here going forward. Out there, got it. Uh, it's based on uh, shape grammar, some uh, theory that was developed based on linguistics in the 1970s, um, in which they develop rules. So you write a pro, you basically program rules for every possible form, and then the um, the program will generate a new city. Every time you change a rule, it regen you can regenerate the city. Thus, um, this allows you to see the flow of spaces and to document every change. And this documentation is important because it gives this uh, for accuracy, of course, but it also makes these kinds of reconstructions seem more scientific and therefore more acceptable in humanistic realms. Thus, scholars interested in the flows of spaces experienced by ritual processions could write rules to test neighborhood densities and, imp and their impact on view sheds and acoustics and audience uh, spaces, as well as changing lighting conditions throughout the day and year and different historical periods. Procedural modeling allows for robust documentation and this showing of every um, change that you make uh, allows you to uh, conduct all sorts of experiments within a recreated cityscape. I selected procedural modeling as an example among many other contemporary tools and dynamic approaches precisely because it was created to integrate entire cities. And as a, a sidebar to that, it's also having the ancient architectures rule-based in its own self. So you could use this system very easily for Roman buildings. It wouldn't work so well for say a Baroque structure. In the architectural world of the 21st century, the drift of design projects, issues, and connections is to ever larger scales. And we uh, modeled the grave uh, structures are infill buildings that are modeled stoicastically. There's 9,000 of them in there. A preoccupation of the size of investigations was famously ignited in 1995 by the tome of a small, medium, and extra large by Rem Koolhaas, Bruce Mao, and Jennifer Sigler. The eponymous uh, founder of the Danish firm, Bjarge Ingels Group, BIG, argues that designers should move beyond master plans and consider the master planet. Grand urban projects are complicated, necessitating 
collaboration across disciplines, and several are underway in Roman studies. Among these is the monumental undertaking by uh, um, uh, Andrea Carandini with Paolo Carafa and a, and a cast of a thousand. Um, to do this um, two volume Atlante Roma d'Antica Biografia e Ritratti della Città, which has a very expansive database, which they said originally would be made available and is not. Um, the associated expanding data set interrogates the constituent, cons uh, the components of Rome's changing environment in order to, quote, define and communicate the dynamics of the past as a constant flow of change and, and um, continuity, unquote. Oh, and by the way, that's over 1500 years. The publication, though, is filled, it has wonderful fill, um, geocoded maps, reconstructions, and impressive to topographical and archaeological de data, but the fixity of the print medium, the dense layout, of the pages and the lack of access to underlying data make temporal and spatial uh, comparison difficult and flows don't seem to appear in the use of this book. The swelling scale of inquiries logically is moving beyond space in cities to consider space uh, flows. Drawing on er interpretations of so, uh, sociologist Manuel Castells, modern designers and planners see today's cities operating within fluid global currents of interconnections formed by circulating ideas, funds, technologies, signs, commerce, images, symbols, and activities. Architect Delalex writes, quote, the space of flows relies on the simultaneity of events and interactions that take place over long distances, unquote. Most of these connections are non-tangible and immeasurable. To show you one example, in 2004, UNESCO launched the Creative Cities Network to promote co cooperation with and among cities that have identified creativity as a strategic factor for sustainable urban development. Shared experiences and aspirations for place marketing link the members rather than similarities in design, setting, size, or even physical connections. Large-scale network analyses have long informed studies of Roman cities, but most concentrated on trade and traffic along physically connected routes. At the 2014 Venice Biennale, architect Coolhouse exploited the famous Putinger map showing the sprawling Roman Empire extending from Britain to India. Touting the map as the first known representation of globalization, Rem printed an enlarged version on a sheer curtain that twisted through the exhibit, its visual interpenetrability, fluttering animation, and scale uh, it was about 316 meters long, affirming, quote, that the world is always already connected with a complex network of exchanges and flows, unquote. Expanded explorations of interactive, non-physical, non-tangential associations are underway in Roman studies, as with the uh, examination of Hadrian's Panhellian um, grouping of cities by the sociologist Ducellus. The layering of complex networks creates entangled textures described as meshworks. Anthropologist Tim Ingold wrote, it is in the entanglement of network lines, not in the connecting of points, that the mesh is constituted. Building on Lefebvre's disposition of uh, meshworks, architect Greg Lynn explored the interoperability of twisting, intertwining networks in his design for the embryonic house, embryological house. In effect, a meshwork creates an ecology, or rather a series of simultaneous um, ecologies with features interwoven as well as interconnected. It's often described as something like felt that's all pushed together. Or as I 
like this new term. Um, information terminologist Ted Nelson said, everything is deeply intertwingled. Horton and, and Purcell draw on meshwork theory in their broad reaching work, The Corrupting Sea, a study of Mediterranean history, which examines nonlinear tangles of people, goods, political power, and ideas connecting and disconnecting in and through broad spatial spheres from cities to local hinterlands to larger administrative regions to the entire Mediterranean basin. This approach, approach can enrich as well as complicate thinking about ancient public urban spaces, inspiring re researchers to explore, for example, how the spatial network of roads and plazas meshed with various conceptual and activity scapes, military scapes, religious scapes, and so on, or how human creators of objects and spaces themselves were created by their inverted networks. The scale and number of issues considered within such large spatial ecologies can seem overwhelming, evoking thoughts of the famous one-to-one -one scale map described by Borges, which was uh, the same size as the area it covered, and so it obscured what it was trying to show. On the positive side, thinking about large and complicated scales of flows regarding Roman public spaces inspires reassessments of interconnections between valuable extra large and extra complicated questions, such as how is Roman space classical? Can we identify specific spatial traits or styles for different areas? Is there a Hadrianic space? How did spatial choreography and wayfinding vary at different scales? Were the voids of Roman public unroofed areas designed as has been posited for those inside buildings? How can shifting our disciplinary and methodological positioning provide new insights? The challenge for future research is to allow for specific analyses of all scales along, across, and through the curves of inquiry while simultaneously acknowledging the dense interconnecting meshwork of knowledge about Roman public spaces. I want to conclude by thinking about activation. Pushing beyond theorization, complex analytical tools and deep research underway, we should always remember that the meaning and evaluation of public space is as evident through engagement. Entering the 21st century, Pressing societal concerns and threats to the conservation of past environments have prompted attempts to activate and inform the broader public about uh, ancient spaces. Stirred to action, practitioners in architecture and urban design are also exploring activists, often interactive performances and exhibitions to address and attract diverse audiences. Much of this work is interdisciplinary. Arch architects and designers are forging creative uh, collaborations with artists, dancers, scholars, and experts in cultural heritage and preservation to spark interrogations of the potent relationships between historic and modern spaces. For example, Joshua Stein generates a new spatial understanding of the much studied column of Trajan by analyzing its interior void through deep research presented in a book and a scaled model large enough to walk into. Um, his stated goal is, quote, to establish a methodology for the transformational use of our inherited patrimony through playful but yet rigorous documentation, modification, and recontextualization, unquote. Situation viewers within, rather outside, the famous column creates a startling and rewarding engagement. Jorge Otero Pilos challenges ideas of preservation and conservation in his art series, The Ethics of Dust, in which he uses latex, liquid latex, to remove centuries of dust, sweat, and pollutants from historic wall surfaces. When dried and separated from their physical remains, the resulting exhibits of the semi-transparent sheets suggest not only the original encounters, but the diverse human activities they once sheltered. 
by detaching surface accretions, he compels spectators to think about accumulations of dirt, humidity, and bodily odors over time. In his exhibit, Cartago Nova, the surface accretions lifted from walls of Roman mines viscerally compares viewer, compels viewers to think about the conditions and actions of ancient slave workers. Performances in historic environments literally animate and intertwine past and contemporary spatial issues. And now I, let's see what am I supposed to do here? The mouse disappeared. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Um, as you'll see here uh, in this um, performance, let's see if we get some sound. Uh, by Brioni Roberts and Melissa Lohan, who deploy dancers with clicking measuring rods to enliven the potent void of the Capitoline Plaza in Rome and activate the famous pavement design, underscoring the power of sound and movement to reconfigure space. Such lively engagement attracts spectators of all types, informing the public while also compelling people to reassess their ideas about connections between the present and the past, the void and the solid, the empty and the occupied, the environment and the senses. For researchers, such exhibitions and performances are provocations for ever richer, more layered studies that consider the long durée of spatial imprints. Yep, one off now. The, thank you. The connection of architectural practice and historical studies, thank you, remains vibrant. In the complex environments of the 21st century, the Moebius strip provides an apt metaphor for studying the pervasive themes in spatial studies that constantly form, deform, and reform in and through time. Many parallel interrogations in other fields are underway, but here with a vibrant architectural turn. With each twist comes a shifting viewpoint that enriches knowledge, production, and in many cases forges provocative new disciplinary collaborations and approaches. Thus the open-endedness of quasi of spatial transdisciplinary uh, investigation is fluid, driving not only from subject positions conceived in advance of research encounters, but erupting in the interstices of research methods, objectives, and desired outcomes. At the same time, the exploration of spatial themes draw from, drawn from a contemporary architecture in activating, permeating, and flowing, repeatedly affirm that space without living, moving, breathing humans is nothing, no matter how we twist, twist and turn. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diane, for an inspiring uh, lecture. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Um, um, let's floor uh, some questions or comments and observations from the audience. how is Roman architecture classical? How would you go about answering that? Or what do you think the next steps are in trying to answer that? I think it's in the act of trying to define it. I don't think you can, well, you could define it within certain parameters of time and, and who's doing the defining. But I think it's something we just assume, oh, that's classical. But what do we mean by that? It becomes too loose. So it becomes an experiential. Yeah. 
Evan? I was wondering if you could go over how uh, the series of works that you selected, defining meshworks, I'm still not entirely uh, understanding what meshworks is as a concept in relation to the topic. Yeah, um, you and me both. Uh, <laughs> it's, you know, network theory is here's a point, here's a point, and you connect. And you may go up like that and down and around, but you have the points. Meshwork says there are no points. If you go to here to there, they still connect. They're connected somewhere else in some other way. So it's it's all pushed together, um, like felt. You know, in when you weave something, you have the thread, but in felt, you just take all the threads and mesh them together. The lecture doesn't quite acknowledge the the consciousness culture psychology and objectives of the original buildings and their construction correct yes so you're actually using the language of the 21st century and reapplying it without acknowledging the original construction even yeah. though they're in very different concepts yeah one of them is the late capitalist uh, theory of impermanence and movement that does not, in fact, value that any building or even any public space has permanence, idea, or value, right? So you're putting on under a modernist heuristic without yeah. referring to or acknowledging the normal previous understanding. Yeah, I should of the time. I should not acknowledge that because you know that's the subject that's been extensively explored, uh, especially with a. Uh, elitist attitude of you know who's the patron and how much we paid for it and so forth because that's where we have the textual and the inscriptions and the documents um so what i i sort of purposely had taken on not using that because it had been studied but i should acknowledge it as a um equally valid part well there's an implied criticism of, criticism of the original criticism of late capitalist velocity of money, for example, yeah. and the impermanence and the impoverization of typology in public space that goes on with late capitalist globalization. Well, of course. You know, so I there's no critical aspect to the modern world where the new theory is born, right? Yes. So. Yeah. Thank you, Diane, so much for such a wonderful and just rich and exciting talk. I, I don't really have a question. I have more of a, a comment, which is your really brilliant insights into restoration and how we think about that open, I think, a really interesting door into exactly what that process means for our later friends starting especially in the 15th but in the 16th and 17th and as I know best the 18th century who try to engage in that practice looking at these same same sites and how the one of the antiquarian's goals always to reconstruct something becomes much more uh, uh, much more foggy uh, I think than, yes. than we have necessarily considered it to be because we we looked using these kinds these kinds of reconstructions that you've shown in the earlier part of your talk and we accept that that is what reconstruction or restoration means uh, without thinking critically about what does that act, how foggy that can be um, yes it can be foggy on a on a lot of levels so but I'll just give one that comes to mind in the late antique period in the forum there were all these statue bases and such that were made out of the pieces that were laying around there and they were always thought oh those they just were didn't have the money to get new ones or something but they really had meaning and why they would take one piece even if they take the inscription and put it upside down the use of it and it's reference to maybe an emperor or something it had some resonance in it and the materials gregor callus has done a lot of work on this um so the act of uh restoration and reusing materials was very meaningful and you know by the renaissance they're getting more towards the 
less meaning in the material and more in what was the ideal form. So there's that sort of trajectory. I also have an observation that I am triggered by your, that reveals the beginning of your uh, lecture. Um, uh, you, you mentioned that uh, a traditional approach of uh, scholarship of antiquity, ancient architecture, is to uh, concentrate on the building rather than on the space, yeah. uh, even less on the exper experience yeah. of the void, connecting the, uh, the individual buildings. And, and uh, so you, you, at some point you discussed the, the building shrouded in, in, in the clouds. Yeah. I forget what, what it was called. And the, the emphasis, as, as you described, was, was on the, the experience of it. The experience of you know, approaching the building and, and going through that edible, interestingly edible fog. Uh, but uh, yeah. that made, made me think about a common approach nowadays because of the approach to urban design. Mm -hmm. that, uh, urban design, uh, perhaps interestingly con connected with that uh, focus on the building, it is nowadays oftentimes or almost invariably an object-focused approach, mm -hmm. uh, meaning that uh, even at the urban level, which sounds absurd, and, and it is probably, uh, such that the uh, you, you uh, individually conceive of the the parts, but not necessarily of the connecting void. And, and when you do that, inevitably the void, the void, the void sorry, is going to be interstitial and, and undefined Undefin in quality. What's left over. Exactly. Yeah. So there's, in a, in a way, there's a lot of emphasis in the, in the area uh, between uh, uh, contemporary art and contemporary architecture, a lot of emphasis, of, emphasis on the experience of the building. But the, the, at the urban level, there's still, in, in my opinion, uh, a lack of attention to the, the kind of experience that we're building for, for the users of the city. Yeah. So that and really... That, that's uh, exactly, I think, a problem today and for studying the past, too. We show these pristine environments for Fora, and they were messy and uh, used in various ways, and also for political and capitalist agendas or imperialist agendas in many cases. And uh, I think these approaches you know, are nudging us to start thinking differently. I tried to make, uh, you know what a negative space model is? You model the void instead of the building. Trying to make one is like crazy because it has the edges blur and just well, how do you draw that? How do you do it on a computer? I haven't come up with any good way to do that. Build the whole thing. I have a, first of all, thank you, Dan. That was a very interesting lecture. Uh, also, you showed us multiple ways of approaching the thought process around seeing the forum. It's a topic that you've covered for more than two decades. And to see you look at it in a different lens altogether was very interesting. My takeaways um, that I took very, uh, like that will go with me for a longer time is freezing of time. I think you spoke about that beautifully when you said you cannot see the forum as something that was a solid time frame that you can just cut and say, this is how the place looked. And it's not just about the forum, but also any place. Mm -hmm. The evolving nature of any area and the way in which it functions and works, I thought was a very provocative as a thought process and should be looked at more carefully because this is what many of the scholars have done. They've taken a period and said that's the most important period to be learned and thus frozen the time in some yeah. ways to examine or explain the way the place is love the graphic where you're showing the Arch of September service still about to get constructed and the way the views completely changed because you are not, you've not enclosed the forum as yet. It's not as solid. It's not as, it's much more open and the experience is much more different. So I think that that was a very intriguing thought process for today evening. The second one I found very intriguing was the perception of the eye. And the fact that many of our visuals are mostly meant to be as if we are hovering from above, 
and not really experiencing a place from the perception of where a person stands mm -hmm. and visualizes the space. Uh, and I would even take it forward to say different ways in which people perceived it um, based on aristocracy and where they were permitted yes. and what they would see and places that they wouldn't be able to go because they were not even permitted to enter or wasn't seen to be as sacred. So I think those are very thought provocative questions that you've put forward and need to be explored so much more. Oh, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll just add a little vignette to that is there, I have looked at where possible um, sort of the relationship of these things to political context. Obviously, this was a little dense, so I didn't have much room. Uh, but I had the, I have written about the, the uh, cranes with their guide ropes for the building of the Arch of Septimius. And they all had, would have had to come down right in front of the Senate and block the Senate just when Septimius was pissed off at them. So, you know, there's a, you can make that political as well. Any more thoughts or questions? I'm just curious about something because I think this is very interesting. You know, you're, you're talking about, you know, the activation. This is, a, these are spaces that were constantly used and constantly change the fact that, you know, when you show the, uh, what is it called, the, you know, when they're covered up with tents or the tarps, the awnings, yeah. the awnings, it was, you know, we've seen it like in the Coliseum that it has, the, but we never actually see a model or anything in, in history of it being used. And I just thought it was interesting. Uh, and I'm just curious, I know we're talking about Rome, but is, has anybody done this in you know other cultural contexts uh because I, I would be very interested to see you know we, we we were very used to seeing westernized i would love to see maybe like in mexico city how this was when it was to yeah. mm -hmm. or you know in india or yeah. in other places has, has that been yes there's been two conferences recently on ephemeral ephemeral architecture and from environments which include it's primarily these are focusing on uh, South American context. I don't remember the exact name, but um, if you look up ephemera, you'll, you'll find it, or email me if you don't, I'll, I have it written down. Uh, because I'm really interested in ephemeral architecture, which uh, would have re really changed the environments. And um, I should say that I didn't mention this, but uh, there are some, places in Asia Minor where you can go, Magnesia is one of them, where there's the, the what we would call forum, but it's, or agora, but it's a Greek to Roman, so it's both. Um, and on the paving, paving, they say, this is where the group from this in the village were standing. That's where the women stand. And it's scar, you know, it's inscribed there, this is where women stand. So there we can give a little bit of something about where people were, but otherwise it's very difficult. And, uh, thank you very much. Thank you all for attending.